All right, uh, good afternoon. My name is Ali Kujuri, and uh, I'm uh, one of the adjunct professor at, the, at this department, engineering science uh, department, which is in fact a, an electrical engineering pro uh, program. And uh, also we have, uh, as you know, the master's program in uh, computer engineering sciences. Well, uh, um, I w uh, on behalf of the department and the School of Science and Technology, let me uh, welcome you all to this uh, fifth lecture of the series, and also, uh, believe it or not, the 92nd uh, lecture since uh, its start in 2006. Uh, before uh, I introduce our guest speaker for today, uh, let me uh, make two announcements. Number one, uh, we are going to have, uh, we have ordered pizza, which is going to be delivered here uh, at 5.30, uh, right after the, uh, the lecture. Also, uh, Two weeks from now, it is on uh, November the 20th, uh, uh, we have uh, a speaker from uh, San Jose State University, uh, Dr. Shahab Ardalan, whose talk is on uh, security awareness on chip design. Uh, the title of the talk uh, for, uh, for today is uh, uh, Radio Frequency MEMS, uh, an Adaptive Wireless System uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Liu Liu, and uh, uh, Dr. Liu Liu received the bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Jiaxiang University. Yep. Okay, uh, University in China in 2004, and the PhD degree from Purdue University uh, in 2010. He was a postdoctoral research associate with the Department of Electrical Engineering and Bridge Nanotechnology Center at Purdue University. He joined the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, uh, University of California, uh, Davis, in November the 1st, 2011. Dr. Liu has extensive experience in MEMS, design, fabrication, and measurement. His research interests include uh, novel MEMS and NEMS uh, devices, uh, RF MEMS, and high-Q tunable components for reconfigurable radio uh, front, front ends, microwave, millimeter wave, and uh, terahertz electronics and antenna. Dr. Liu has published more than 35 referred conference and journal papers. As a student, he was awarded the Graduate Fellowship uh, from the IEEE Antenna and Propagation Society. So here is Dr. Liu. Thank you, Ali, for the introduction. Okay, so I've changed the title of the talk slightly, uh, but it doesn't, I didn't change the, the content. Um, and Primarily, I'm going to talk about RF MEMS devices and uh, their application in reconfigurable uh, radio front ends. Um, and there are some terminologies here that I will explain. Okay, so I'll start with a slide um, that is very crowded here. Uh, what, so what you're seeing here, all these dots, are different wireless communication standards. So this include your cell phones, Wi-Fi's, Bluetooth. Um, everything and also it includes some of the military communication uh, standards. So all of these standards, the horizontal uh, axis is frequency from about 1 megahertz to 100 gigahertz. So 1 megahertz is about 10 to the 6 hertz cycle per second and 1 gigahertz is about 10 to the 9th cycle per second. So 100 gigahertz is really high in frequency. And the vertical axis is the data rate. Okay, so. The, the point of the slides is to show you, you know, how many different wireless standards we have and how widely spread they are in terms of frequency and data rates. And here is another picture you know, showing what we want today uh, with our cell phones maybe. So already our cell phones are 
Um, today, cell phones are actually amazing devices. Uh, if you think about it, you have GPS on here, which is wireless. You can do Wi-Fi. You can do, you know, your 4G uh, network, um, and some of them can do radio. And there are applications on the horizon where you can even start watching TV on your cell phones. You have all of them in such a small device um, that are functioning, and that's sort of the trend for the future. People want more functionalities in an ever smaller device, probably with longer battery life and, and all that. So that basically means we're integrating more and more different standards into this small device. And in, in terms of wireless, um, that's also the trend. We want to have uh, more functionalities. And here is a result of that desire. So, so this is a chip that actually ships with some of today's cell phones. The chip is made uh, by Qualcomm. And it is compatible with all different 3G wireless standards uh, at working at different frequencies. Uh, what you're looking at here is basically, in order to talk over many different frequencies, uh, and we know today that you know, 3G networks work on 800 megahertz, 900 megahertz, 1800 megahertz, and all that. In order to work at all these different frequencies, you put many different wireless transceiver systems and these hardware is in parallel. So you basically put lots of, lots of them in parallel onto a single chip. And that is made possible by integrated circuits technology because you can nowadays make transistors really small. So you can make these circuits in a very small volume. But the problem here is that there are some devices that doesn't scale with integrated circuits. So what you see here, uh, this block in blue represents our IC um, chip. Right? It has all the active components for the circuits. You have lots of them you know, being integrated in parallel. But there are certain components like filters, right? these smaller blocks in blue, that you cannot put on an integrated circuit chip right? because you want them to have extremely high quality factor. That's another uh, metric we're going to talk about. And it turns out that it's very hard to, to make it integrated on an IC. So you still have to live with these uh, off-chip components, and that basically limits how small you can put the entire circuit um, to be. So as we go into the next generation wireless communication systems, for example, the upcoming, actually we already have some of that, the fourth generation cellular networks, we're actually looking at integrating even more of these parallel channels uh, into our systems. In fact, for the fourth generation cellular networks, we've been allocated more than 40 bands across the globe, right? So for 3G and 2G, if you want a cell phone that you can do uh, global roaming, it's relatively easy because there are only, you know, three or four bands that, that uh, these standards work around the globe. But talking about 40 bands and putting all of them on a single chip, that's becoming really, really difficult. So what is the solution? And here is a possible solution, right? It's a very difficult route, but uh, this is you know, one strategy that we want to simplify hardware system designs in order to tackle this problem where we have many different frequency bands uh, with all very different uh, standards. So instead of putting many of the wireless communication hardware in parallel, we choose to do a tunable hardware. So in a sense, we use maybe one uh, transmitter and receiver system, but we make the hardware parameters tunable. If you want to use your Bluetooth at 24 megahertz, 2400 megahertz today, you tune to 2400 megahertz. If you're going to another country and you want to talk over the cellular network that is working at 1900 megahertz, maybe you tune your hardware to a different frequency. Okay? Now, that sounds simple. The concept is very simple. If your hardware can be somehow reconfigured, as if you were write, rewriting a program, uh, then this system design would be a lot more um, would be a lot more simpler. But it turns out that it's extremely hard to do, right? Because we are already stressing our hardware in order to you know, squeeze the best performance out of them, and now we want them to be tunable. That's like adding another level of requirement, and that turns out to be very hard. Uh, before I start talking about the research part, I just want to mention that you know, the start of uh, some of this research was funded by DARPA, uh, where they were looking at exactly the same problem uh, of how to integrate 
many different radios or wireless uh, systems into a single chip or maybe a single board. And this program started by looking at a radio that is capable of receiving signals between 80 megahertz to 6 gigahertz with 25 megahertz constant bandwidth. Uh, and you should be able to freely tune the center frequency uh, within this range. Okay, so that's sort of pushed a lot of this technology that we're going to talk about today. And also, we're going to talk briefly about uh, quality factor, right? So this gets a little bit technical for some of you here, but you basically think of it as a measure of how lossy your circuit components are, okay? If you have a high Q component, that means it's less lossy. If you have a low Q component, that means it's quite lossy. And if you want to use some of these components in the filter, and that's one of the topics that we're going to address today, and a filter is basically a device that will allow some signal to pass, but some other signals to be rejected. And here is an example filter shape where you see at the center here, the transmission is high. At the skirt level here, the transmission is low. So it turns out if you are to design a microwave filter, you really need very low loss component, right? You want the Q to be very high. Otherwise, your passband here, where you allow signal to pass, would give you a lot of loss, and that will impact negatively your system performance. Okay? So a center theme here is to get high Q. And then we look at some of the technologies that are available today that allow you to make a tunable device, and in particular, tunable filters. Okay? Because when you are talking about a system that can change its center frequency, you actually don't want um, signals from other frequencies to come into your system. So we always apply some filtering uh, in front of our uh, wireless system. So some a br very brief review of uh, tunable filter technologies. People use uh, essentially circuit components that can be changed uh, in, its, uh, in its value. For example, a varactors, meaning a capacitor whose capacitance can be changed by applying a voltage. Uh, and you can integrate varactors with uh, you know, resonators, uh, planar type of resonators, microstrip lines, so that they can form a filtering function. Okay? Now the problem with these technologies is that they are relatively low Q, in other words, high loss. Okay? So they can be made tunable you know, across uh, maybe a 2 to 1 frequency ratio, but they're somewhat uh, lossy and is very not, uh, not very suitable. And there are other explorations, and this is it shows you some example of RF MEMS devices, and MEMS means micro electrical mechanical systems. They're basically very small machines and down to the order of a few hundred micrometers or maybe a few tens of micrometers. But because they're so small, you can start moving them more easily because their mass is low and their stiffness becomes lower also. But so if you can you know, move some parts of the circuit, maybe you can change not only the mechanical configuration, but also the electrical configuration. Right? There, there's been some work uh, in this area, but most of the demonstrated work don't show a lot of tuning range. And even though you can get you know, higher quality factor, meaning lower loss, than the previous case of planar tunable filters. Right? And in fact, if you want to get the best filter, right, the best technology that we have today are uh, called the EEG filters, and this is a ferry magnetic crystal that would oscillate at a particular frequency depending on the external magnetic field. Okay. Uh, so we have Agilent here, uh, or very near. They make all these high-end uh, measurement instruments that are essentially very wide band systems. And they employ EEG filters and EEG oscillators in their instrument. Right? These tunable filters are extremely good. Uh, Qs are very high and tuning range is extremely wide. Now there is one problem, as I mentioned, that they require an external magnetic field to tune the resonance. And whenever we talk about magnetic field, you think about currents, you know, a coil that generates the, uh, the field that, that you, can, you can adjust. So they consume quite a bit of current and they consume quite a bit of uh, power, actually. And they're not all that small. Okay? Power hungry is you know, one of the disadvantages of these technologies. So essentially, we want you know, a technology that can give us high Q, meaning low loss, and wide tunability. Okay, so that's, um, you know, where we set out to do this research. Okay, 
And we actually started out from a very old technology that's called evanescent mode cavity resonators. For those of you who have taken uh, electromagnetics <coughs> class, uh, this is essentially a cavity resonator. It's all enclosed uh, by metal surfaces. And you know, if you solve the Maxwell's equation inside this cavity, you see that they form a standing wave pattern. And E field and H field sort of resonate, you know, alternating between each other. Um, if you introduce a perturbation right, to this hollow cavity, what happens is that the resonant frequency would decrease. Okay? And traditional people have taken advantage of this to make filters, right? very high Q waveguide based filters. But what is interesting is when we look at the extreme case, all right, so this is a cylindrical cavity uh, with a cylindrical type of metallic post in the center. And we take it to the extreme in the sense that we let this gap G here to be extremely small. And we're talking about a few to a few tens of micrometers. You know, one micrometer is 10 to the negative 6 meter, you know, one thousandth of a millimeter. So that's really, really small. So what happens when you make that gap really small? When, what happens when you push that post almost touching the post? Okay, as we mentioned, when you introduce this metallic post, your resonant frequency goes down, as, as shown in this figure. But if you look at the extreme case, where my horizontal axis is the gap, and the vertical axis is the resonant frequency, I see that if I go from 5 to 10 or maybe 15 micrometers, my resonant frequency changes from 2.5 to 4.5. So that's a lot of change, actually. So a few gigahertz of change by just changing the shape of this thing by a few micrometers. Okay. So that's a first clue that maybe we can make this happen. You know, I remember I mentioned that if you make things really small, it's easier to move them around. Okay. And we're talking about a really small movement of maybe 5 to 10 micrometers. Okay. So it becomes possible to do something. And this is our solution. All right. So we have a cavity that I described. It's a cylindrical cavity and we have a metal post in the center, right? And we have this gap that we push it to be really small. And what we want to do is to change the center frequency. So we have a flexible membrane here that hopefully we can deflect up and down so that we can change this gap to change the resonant frequency. So we did that by electrostatic attraction. All right, so you see a metallic diaphragm here and then there is a bias electrode placed some distance above it, but they are isolated in, in DC. Okay. There, there is no conducting path between them. And if you apply a voltage here, let's say we apply a positive voltage on this electrode, you're going to induce some positive charges on this electrode, and therefore you would have some negative charges on this diaphragm. And you all know that if you have positive charges, negative charges sitting close to each other, what would, what would they do? they would attract each other. Right? And by the way, feel free to ask questions or you know, break my talk here and if you, if you um, have anything that you don't um, understand. All right, so you put positive and negative charges together, they start attracting each other, and therefore the result is that you start deflecting this diaphragm. And when you deflect it, this gap changes and then the resonant frequency changes. Okay? So we went on and make this device the important part here is this thin diaphragm. Okay, so we want it to be thin enough so that it's not so stiff we can't move it. Uh, and in fact, this diaphragm here is about three micrometers. It's extremely thin. Um, and we made this out of a uh, SOI wafer. So an SOI wafer means silicon on insulator. So it is an interesting silicon uh, substrate where you have a thicker layer of silicon, and we're talking about maybe 500 micrometers, half a millimeter to a millimeter thick. And then you have a layer of silicon dioxide, right? This is the oxide of silicon. And on top of that, you have a thin, another thin layer of silicon, okay? And this thin layer of silicon is about three to five micrometers. In fact, you can choose how thick it is. You just go to the vendor and tell them that I want a particular thickness. They will make it for you. All right, so the nice thing about an SOI wafer is that this very thin layer of silicon can be made as a single crystal material. And that basically means it doesn't have internal stress, residual stress in it. Okay, so it's a stress-free material. 
and when you release the diaphragm, it's going to come out to be flat. Right? You definitely don't want residual stress in there because it may buckle the beam, you know, making it wrinkly. So in order to make this, we basically etch from the handle layer side, we remove the silicon, you know, majority of this handle layer, and then we expose the silicon dioxide. And then we went on to etch the silicon dioxide to leave this silicon layer there. You know, it's very thin, flexible. And before you know, we complete the cavity resonator, we want to coat it with a thin layer of metal. Because for, if you've learned electromagnetics, you will understand or appreciate the fact that you need very highly conductive materials in order to make a low loss resonator. Okay, so in this case, we put about 0.5 micrometer thick of gold. Right? Gold is one of the most conductive materials we have access to. Right? So here is a picture of some fabricated examples. Now the cavity, we made it in a sort of casual way. We basically machined it uh, out of a circuit substrate. And this is a TMM uh, substrate. It's a ceramic based material. So we milled out the shape we want and we plated where we, we, wherever we uh, want metal uh, to make a connection. All right, so bias electrode is also fabricated in, on, uh, based on the silicon wafer. And then finally, we put all of these together. So you're seeing you know, this piece of thin diaphragm is being assembled onto the cavity resonator right, while we're looking at it on, on the DNA. Okay. So here is an example measurement. I mentioned if we apply a voltage, then that voltage will attract this thin diaphragm. Okay, so as it attracts the thin diaphragm, it's going to change the gap and therefore change the frequency. So here is exactly what happens when you when you increase the amount of voltage being applied. Okay, um, so as you increase the voltage, the diaphragm is being attracted away from the post, and you're like increasing this gap. And I mentioned previously that if you decrease the gap, the frequency would actually go down. So when you increase the gap, it's just the other way. The frequency would go up. That's exactly what you see on this measurement, right? You increase the voltage from zero volt to 120 volt. The resonant frequency changes from about 1.9 gigahertz to 4.7, uh, actually 5.1 gigahertz. So that's about 2.6 to one tuning range. And across this tuning range, it's all analog, you know, meaning you can park anywhere between uh, this frequency range. Okay, so we have the, the hope of making a filtering structure, right? If you look at each one of these peaks, it's like high transmission here and low transmission elsewhere. That's an indication of a filtering function. So you can indeed build a tunable filter out of this structure, but before that, um, we'll look at some repeatability measurement here. Right? So people worry about you know, whether this device is going to last for long or whether you can really hit a particular frequency point when you dial in the voltage. And in fact, that was a concern. We built some devices you know, before we did this MEMS implementation. We had a piezoelectric actuator to move this diaphragm up and down. Okay, so piezoelectric materials is, uh, is a material when you apply a voltage, you will develop a mechanical stress. Okay, and if you configure it properly, you can deform this material when you apply a voltage. Now, the problem with the piezoelectric materials is that they have this inherent hysteresis response. Okay, so you could go up in frequency, but when you go down by decreasing the voltage, they don't follow the same path. Right, so that creates a difficult control problem because where you are at this moment depends on where you were in the previous moments, right? It, it has hysteresis in, uh, built in the material, so it's kind of hard to make, uh, to control this device. Now, with the electrostatic case, where you apply a voltage and you re rely on positive and negative charges to make the movement, you don't have such a problem. It's extremely repeatable. When you ramp up the voltage and when you ramp down the voltage, they follow almost exactly the same curve. Okay, so that's you know one benefit of the technology. And if we look at the stability, yes. Uh, question for you: uh, You were showing uh, in, in the other one that you had the S21. Showing, oops, all the oh. all different voltages. Yep. So, uh, how about the loss? The loss seems to be 
Very high. Somewhere around 25. Yes. Something. Yeah. Exactly. So um, this is the S21. Uh, it's called S from a scattering parameter, and S21 basically means if I have a two-port device, uh, we have an input port and output port. How much is being transferred to the output because of an excitation at the in, uh, at the input? Okay. And the question was, you know, these levels look extremely low. Uh, minus 30 dB is about one out of a thousand. Um, so you don't get a lot of transmission at all. And that's actually a trick that we play when we measure these resonators, because, you know, you think of a you think of a resonator as how many of you have learned about resonators in circuit classes? You know, at least some of you, right? Okay, so you, you think of a resonator as, a, as a, in, an inductor and a capacitor, and then you may have some loss in it, which is a resistor. Okay, But when you measure it, you actually need to put some energy into the resonator and measure the response. So what you're really doing is you take a measurement system, this system may have some source impedance, let's say it's 50 ohm in our case, and then you would measure how much energy is being transformed into the resonator and then out of the resonator. Okay. Now, the problem here is that you don't want to actually directly connect to the resonator, because if you do, then this 50 ohm is going to load the resonator. Right, so mind you, this resistor is actually fairly big if you are talking about a high Q resonator. This usually is in the thousands of ohms of range. But if you directly put a 50 ohm, then what you're going to see is a very you know, wide resonance curve. You know, this can tell you what the resonant frequency is, but it actually doesn't tell you what the Q is, meaning how lossy this resonator is. Because all you are seeing would be the 50 ohms, right? not this one. So in order to measure this one, we actually want to put a transformer here so that I turn my 50 ohm into maybe one mega ohm as an exaggeration. And then if you do that, you can measure this 1,000 ohm resistor, which is the intrinsic Q of the resonator. But when we do that transformation, when we make it a very large impedance, you're basically lowering this transmission. Okay. And in that sense, you know, you're looking at this very sharp peak. That's almost exactly what's what this part of the circuit represents, you know, without looking at the source and load impedance. Okay. So this is a way to isolate the loading effect when you do the measurement. Right? So when you look at something you actually is perturbing it. Right. Okay. Um, so this is some other you know, experiment where we show that it's a fairly stable device. Um, and um, we did some further characterization. And I think this is interesting to, to mention here, um, you know, how we measure the speed of this device. You know. um, we want to know, right, when you tune these diaphragms up and down, how fast you're doing it. Okay. And here is one way we, we measured it. Uh, we take advantage of you know, the latest instrument that we have. So we had a real-time spectrum analyzer in the lab. So what it means, you can measure a slice of frequency. You can look at what's going on in that slice of frequency versus time. Okay, so you see this sort of a waterfall uh, plot of the frequency. So horizontal axis is frequency, and this has a bandwidth of about 36 megahertz. And the vertical axis is time. So it's a time evolution of the frequency spectrum. So we set up our measurement like this. Okay? We have a wideband signal uh, that is about 36 megahertz. And then we pass our resonator through that signal. Right? So you think of our resonator as you know, a very simple filter. Right? Whenever we have this peak, we're going to have more signals coming out. And whenever you have, you know, you're aligned somewhere here, you don't have much of a transmission. So when our filter actually travels through our wideband signal, it is only when, you know, when the filter is actually within this bandwidth that you see some transmission, you know, across the center frequency of the filter. So what you end up seeing is a straight line, you know, this you know, more red color means more signal transmission. So you see a straight line going through the spectrum within a certain time range. 
So then we can look at this measurement. We have 36 megahertz. And this filter, when it's being tuned, it travels through this 36 megahertz within about 6 microsecond or so. Right? And then we take the ratio of that when we know the speed. Okay, so it travels 36 megahertz over 5 or 6 uh, microsecond, or don't actually remember the exact number, but that gives us a number of about 40, 450 gigahertz per second. That's how fast it can tune around in terms in, in frequency. Now, the interesting thing here is that you know, when you tune this filter up, when you give it a high voltage and you move the diaphragm up, it's faster because you're actually giving it an excitation, right? But when you go down, when you get rid of that actuation voltage, it will fall back to its original position. That's actually a slower process, right? So it's not very symmetric. You know, tuning up process is fast, tuning down is, uh, is slower. Um, and obviously, this would be the limit for, for the speed of the tunable filter, you know, about 60 gigahertz per, per second in this range. Okay. Question. Yeah. Uh, why do we need now the, such a fast uh, tunability going up? Um, Where's the application? Well, so there is always an application for faster tunable filters. Um, this different application calls for a different requirement on speed, right? If let's say we just want to build a wireless transmission or a wireless system that can work with different standards, if I'm traveling back to China tomorrow. You know, I can flip a switch and it will work in China. Then you don't actually care about speed, right? Because, you know, I just need to do it once. But there are certain applications where you do care about speed. And one example is in the military, you know, electronic warfare systems or secure communication system where they do frequency hopping. Okay, so when you transmit, you transmit at different frequencies and you change that frequency extremely rapidly so that it's hard for an enemy to to listen to, right? So the EW people really care about speed. They want a filter that can tune around within nanosecond or picosecond range. Um, and here, our filter is, is not actually close to that speed. We're talking about 100 microsecond range, because after all, these are mechanical systems. Something has to move, and that movement takes a finite amount of time. But but yes, to answer you know the question about why we need higher tuning speed, I guess you know different applications call for different requirements. Um, so I mentioned about the possibility of having a tunable filter, a, a better controlled transfer function, right? So previously we look at just one of these resonators, one diaphragm, one cavity, one post, and you can tune the frequency up and down. Um, you can put multiples of these together so that you can control you know, the transfer function or the shape of the filter. Right? So this goes back to that question, you know, why is the S21 so low? And that's basically because we want to characterize this thing. When you actually you know, make it into a filter, you can do your design carefully so that your S21 is actually not that low. So in this case, my S21 is between you know, 3.5 dB to uh, 2.3 dB, right? For a very narrow band filter, this filter has uh, a fractional bandwidth of 0.7%. It's less than 1% uh, bandwidth, very narrow band, uh, and fairly low loss. And that's because the quality factor is very high. So we're talking about a quality factor in, a, in the range of 400 to 600. And we actually had some other resonators in the lab that exceed 1,000 with similar tunabilities um, in, in terms of frequency. Okay. Um, so this filter that we built worked from about you know, 3 gigahertz to 4.7 gigahertz. And if you remember, when we talked about the resonators, the resonator itself actually tuned from about 2 gigahertz to 5 gigahertz. Okay. That's about 2.5 to 1. And when, when you put them into a filter, uh, design, when you have two of them, you actually sacrifice part of that tuning range because right after fabrication, they're not aligned really well, right? The two resonators are resonating at different frequencies, and then you have to use part of the tuning range to compensate for that. And therefore, you know, the total amount of tuning range is slightly lower 
than the single resonator, right? So that also points to you know another direction where here we look at these two filters. They're actually hand assembled. You know, I made them by hand, uh, sort of, you know, uh, a lab curiosity type of device. You make one and you measure the result. You're happy and you publish, right? Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, a future direction would be to look at how you make them uh, extremely repeatable when you when you manufacture lots and lots of them. And one possibility here that we show some clues uh, is to is to fabricate them in batch. Uh, instead of relying on individual diaphragms, what about we fabricate lots of them together on the same wafer? Right? Here is an example where I see, you know, hundreds of these, you know, tunable filters fabricated all within one piece of silicon wafer. And by, you know, taking advantage of microfabrication, there is also potential to make them uh, higher in resonant frequency, working over a wider frequency range. Now, so far we've talked about filters that would allow some signals to pass, but reject other signals. And that actually there is the inverse of that. There are filters out there that will reject some of the signals, but allow all other signals to pass. Right? So we call these filters the band pass filters. And they could be useful when you have interference around your signal of interest. Right? So in this case, let's say the blue signal is the one that you are interested in, and you may have somebody else is transmitting right beside you in terms of frequency, right? There may be a stronger signal transmitting very close to you. So if you can have a tunable band stop filter, you can basically move your band stop filter to wherever that interferer is and make that smaller, you know, make it appear smaller to you, okay? So that will help improve the quality of wireless communication if you have access to such a technology. And in fact, if we use our tunable filter, we can in our tunable resonator, we can indeed design these tunable band stop filters. Here are some examples uh, where we're showing a four pole filter, meaning we have four resonators, okay? Then you can design it properly so that all these four resonators, they come at the same frequency, okay? And then you can show a rejection in the passband, right? a rejection of transmission. And this rejection can be tuned over the frequency, over a frequency range. Right? So this is actually, all of these graphs is showing one <coughs> filter you know, whose passband can be tuned around. Uh, a stop band can be tuned around, I'm sorry. Now the interesting thing about tunable band stop filters versus tunable band pass filters is that depending on how, where, you put the resonance of these resonators, you can actually control how much of attenuation you have for, for the band stop filters, right? You can split the four resonators apart. You can sort of see these four different resonances. You can split them apart around the center frequency in order to make the stop band wider, right? Or you can squeeze them in uh, very close in order to increase the absolute amount of attenuation you could have, but then you pay a little penalty in terms of you know, the bandwidth of your stop band. So there is actually a lot of uh, tunability in, in this filter. And what you can also do when you are putting this into a band stop uh, tunable filter configuration is that you can split the frequencies really wide apart. Okay, so in this case we've shown, um, you know, one stop band being tuned over the frequency, but you can actually put, let's say, two of these resonators at one particular frequency and two others at some other different frequency. So you could have a one stop band with all four resonators together, or you could have two stop bands with two resonators each. Or you can even have four stop bands with one resonator each. Now obviously the penalty you pay is the amount of attenuation you have in each of the stop bands. <coughs> Now, the second part of the talk, uh, which I'm going to you know, go through pretty fast, uh, is in terms of power handling. Because when we look at these tunable filters, one important metric is how much absolute RF power they can handle. Right? That also depends on where you want to use them. The previous case where I said, you, know, you may have a strong interferer coming into your system and you want to knock it out with a band stop filter. But what if this interferer is really, really strong, it's really high power, and your filter cannot take 
that much of power in, at its input. Right? You may risk destroying your filter or your wireless system if that happens. So we were interested in looking at how much um, you know, power handling capability we could have or we could, how much power we could pass through these filters. And we discovered some interesting phenomena along the way. And this is really uh, very academic, but you know, I want to share it with you nevertheless. So we measured this resonator with low power, right? And we get a response that is, uh, that looks like this green curve. And that's a typical resonator shape that you would see in your textbook, right? When you measure your LC resonator, you look at the frequency response, and this is what you expect to see. It's highest transmission in the center, and then lowest on the two sides, and they're symmetric, right, if you plot it on the uh, log scale. Now, if we look at our resonator, as we increase the amount of power, it actually starts to behave weird. Right? It's not symmetric anymore. Uh, instead, it tilts to one side. It sort of distorts to the lower frequency. Right? And if you keep increasing um, the amount of power, you see something really strange, right? You see this straight line here, vertical, straight vertical line here. It looks almost like when you're doing the frequency switch, it jumps from this point to that point. It looks like a discontinuous function right there. You know? So that's fairly interesting when we, when we did the test in the lab. And we were curious about why that happened, right? Why you could get this type of a response out of a passive microwave device, which is you know, supposed to be linear. Okay. So we're definitely seeing some nonlinear behavior right here. Okay. And after much thought, you know, we came up with this explanation of why it could behave uh, somewhat nonlinearly. Right. If we look at this response in blue, for example, it's not symmetric anymore. So we're looking at a shape that is tilted to one end. Right. So that's sort of an indication of you know, some asymmetry in the system. Right? If we look at two signals, you know, one signal that is higher than the resonance, resonant frequency here, and the other signal that is somewhat lower than the resonant frequency here. So if we look at these two signals and then we look at the response, would they come out to be the same? Right? If they don't come out to be the same, maybe we have some explanation of why, you know, we have this asymmetric shape in terms of the transfer function. Okay. So, in fact, we actually look at what's going on in the resonator. So, let's imagine we have some RF power coming in. Okay. So, it's a AC power, right? You have alternating uh, electric field or voltage. And you think of this resonator here, this structure here, as an LC resonator, pretty much like this. We have an inductor and we have a capacitor. And there is actually a very close analogy here. If you look at this small gap, you have a metal surface, you have another metal surface separated by a small gap that looks like a capacitor, right? And then you have this long line here that looks like an inductor. So this resonator itself, it behaves pretty much like an LC resonator right here. And then when you pass RF power through it, you are going to have some AC voltage that is oscillating on your resonator, okay? And this AC voltage will appear across the, uh, this capacitor. In other words, the AC voltage is going to appear across this gap, right? Now, when we talked about the actuation of these diaphragms, we said we apply a DC voltage, and therefore the DC voltage induces positive and negative charges and they attract each other. And my question for you is, when I have an AC voltage, am I going to have some attraction force as well. So if you have two metal plates being placed very close to each other and you pass an AC voltage across it, are they going to attract each other? Yes or no? The answer is yes, they would attract each other because even though you have an AC voltage, right? At some instant, you have positive charge on the top plate, negative charge on the bottom plate. At some other instance, they're going to flip, right? You have negative on the top, bottom, uh, uh, positive on the bottom. But at all these instances, it's always attraction because you have positive on one, negative on the other. 
Doesn't matter where they are, right? They always attract each other. So if you look at the force, you know, between here and here, right, this is where our AC signal is passing through. If you look at the force between the two plates, they always attract each other. So when you pass high power through this device, right, there is a competing mechanism here. You know, one is my DC voltage is going to pull this up. My AC voltage while going through this cavity is going to pull this down. Right? So there is that tendency. So the two actually counteract with each other. My AC voltage, and, and again, my, my AC voltage coming in here, it will pull the diaphragm down. So how would it change the frequency then? It will make the two plates closer, capacitance increases, and frequency would go down. Right? So when you have high enough power, the frequency, the resonant frequency actually will go down. So that's what happens. Right? So let's start with this first case, where you have a signal that is slightly higher than your resonant frequency. And then you look at what's going on in the resonator. Right? Because of this relatively high power, the resonant frequency is going, is going down like that. Right? So this peak shifts to a lower frequency. And the consequence of that is the amount of voltage you develop across the capacitor. And this is sort of the transfer function of, and you look at the voltage, AC voltage across the capacitor, it actually also decreases. Right? Compared to the previous case, um, it decreases. Okay? So the AC voltage across the capacitor is lower than the initial case. And what does that mean? That means my resonant frequency actually tends to go up a little bit because the amount of pull down force is lower now right, because my resonant frequency shifts. So if I look at this process and I say I have a moderate power, so you, know, you can think of this as a negative feedback process. I put in a lot of power, it will pull the diaphragm down, but if I do that, the amount of voltage is lower, so I don't have enough force, so it will go up a little bit. All right, so if that process continues, you stabilize at somewhere in between. Right? So that's the first case. But the scenario is different, and this is the distinct. Right? The scenario is different when you put a voltage or a signal that is lower than the resonant frequency. Okay? You know, similar to the previous case, when you input an RF power in here, it's going to pull down the, the, the diaphragm lower the resonant frequency, but as the resonant frequency goes lower, you actually see a higher RF voltage across the capacitor. And therefore, you're going to pull it down even further. Right? So you think about it as maybe a positive feedback process. So this gives you a hint of why the resonant frequency or the transfer function of this device could look different you know, when you uh, could look asymmetric you know, when you increase the amount of power. And I'm going to skip these slides. We actually went on to, to model this mathematically and actually were able to explain precisely and, and replicate that behavior precisely. Um, so we integrated the mathematics into a circuit simulator. This is Agilent Analog uh, Advanced Design Systems where you can have a circuit block that whose behavior is, is entirely described by a bunch of equations. So you put those equations into the circuit simulator and you see that we can reproduce that effect entirely. Right? You will now look at a passive device that is showing somewhat of a nonlinear behavior. Okay? This nonlinear behavior is not coming from you know the pass is not coming from the electronics. The inductor is still a linear inductor uh, the capacitor is somewhat nonlinear, and that nonlinearity is not like a diode, you know, capacitor where it's dependent on voltage. Instead, it's an electromechanical nonlinearity, right? It's nonlinear because it's moving up and down, right? Because of a mechanical force. But anyways, you know, we could perfectly explain uh, what was going on when you input m more power into the system. Yes. What <clears throat> did the resonant frequency look? Extreme of the, of the power. Okay, so if you keep increasing the amount of power, um, right, so we have these, uh, in the low power case, it's symmetric, right? Your textbook, you know, resonator shape. 
as you increase the amount of power, it will start to bend towards the lower frequency. If you even increase the power to a level even higher than that, you start to see this type of behavior, which is fairly interesting. I'm going to redraw it here. So you're seeing the transfer function being a transfer function that looks like that. Right? That looks a little bit strange because for some frequencies, you have three solutions. Okay, so I look at a signal that is coming in at 2 gigahertz. There are three possible transmission values. And that will not happen in reality. Okay, so it's always one to one. So what in, actually what happens is we call this bifurcation, right? You have multiple solutions to your equations. What happens is if you sweep your frequency lower to higher, then you're going to see you're not going you're not going to go into this region. You basically jump toward this point, and then you traverse this side. But you're, if you're going to sweep from the higher to the lower side, you're going to go here, and then jump down, and come back. All right, so this device will start to behave. There is some hysteresis in the frequency response, and it really depends on where, you know, which direction you're going, right? But we don't consider this portion, right? We know this is interesting, when you look at the mathematics, when you solve the equations, in, all of a sudden you can reproduce exactly what you measure. Um, so that's interesting, but I don't think we want to operate in this range, right? You want to avoid such a behavior from, from happening, right? And in fact, you know, the moment where we start to have this, you know, I call it, that would be the limit of your, um, of your operating range. You don't want this bifurcation to happen, right? So in between the two cases, you have uh, one state actually, you know, where this point and this point converge to be one, right? So you have an intermediate state where it's exactly like that. Where at this point, the slope is infinity. Right? That's sort of the limit. Okay. All right. So, um, and once we have developed the circuit models, you know, we can actually start simulating more complex structures because the mathematics explains one resonator only you know, under certain conditions uh, but it doesn't explain um, it, it cannot be applied to a more complex circuit but once you have the circuit model you can start simulating or predicting performance for you know multipole filters here is an example of a four pole uh, filter structure um, and you can look at the amount of voltage and how the you know, frequency response would behave if you have uh, higher power handling. So that turned out to be a pretty, um, pretty nice tool for us. Um, a few words on future directions. You know, tunable filters is definitely um, an area that is worth, you know, further research. We still don't have the ideal tunable filter that everyone wants. You know, very high Q, very low loss, widely tunable, and hopefully that can be tuned within no time, um, but, you know, um, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done uh, to achieve that ideal tunable filter. Uh, power handling, you know, going, you know, continuing from our discussion of power handling, there is another mechanism here that may come, in play, come into play when you talk about really high power handling devices, and that is the dielectric breakdown. So I mentioned previously, you know, these filters were made with a very small gap. We're talking about a few micrometers to maybe a few tens of micrometers. If you pass high power through it, then you definitely worry about breakdown over that small of a gap. Okay? Turns out that the breakdown mechanisms at these small gaps and at these high frequencies not all that well understood. So we understand about DC breakdown very well. Okay? We have both theory and experiments. But when it comes down to this small range, when we're talking about a gap of a few micrometers, physics starts to change. Right? And you start seeing interesting measurement data that deviates from traditional uh, theory. And especially when you go to these high frequencies, you know, a few gigahertz or a few tens of gigahertz, um, 
people actually don't know what is going on. Right? So there is a lot of interesting things to look at. You know, when you can make a filter that is tunable and with such a small gap, critical gap in there, uh, there may be you know interesting physics to explore. Um, so the tunable filter concept could also possibly be extended to you know active circuits. You know, so far we've talked about passive filters, but they may be able to be integrated into amplifiers or oscillators, and we've done some work on that actually. And here is an example. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have taken an RF design class uh, before, but essentially in high frequency circuits, the conventional wisdom is that we all design to a 50 ohm system impedance. Okay? In fact, if you have a tunable technology, okay, if you have some circuits that can change its parameters, you actually no longer have to design everything to 50 ohm because the reason that you want everything to be 50 ohm is that they can be um, cascaded together more easily without signals being reflected. Um, so everyone can form to one standard and they can all you know, connect with each other. But if you have a tunable device whose impedance can be tuned, right? let's say my output impedance or the input impedance of my um, amplifiers can be anything that you want, then you don't need to worry about these 50 ohm things and just connect components together and tune so that their impedance match with each other. Right? So that may potentially save you know, <coughs> a board area in terms of extra matching network that you can get rid of if you have tunable uh, elements. Right? To jump through this. And here is an example of that. Um, when we look at a low noise amplifier design, conventionally we say, you know, when you do a low noise amplifier, you would have to provide an optimal matching to the input of this amplifier so that the noise figure is the lowest, right? But if you were to do a fixed low noise amplifier design, you only achieve that matching right here at one particular frequency because your matching network is always frequency dependent and you almost always design it to be optimal at one particular frequency point. However, if you have tunable components, right, it may be possible for you to design a matching network that can track the minimal noise figure of your device across the frequency range. Right? If you don't have to be extremely wideband, you can basically have a tunable system that can always give you a low noise figure you know, wherever you are in terms of frequency. Right? So tunable components definitely will give you a lot of flexibility in terms of circuit design, but obviously there will be more complications in terms of design, fabrication, and you know, reliability, repeatability, and all that. So coming back to this first picture uh, that we showed right here. You know, our dream here is to have a hardware system eventually whose components can be tuned around. Right? It's almost like a hardware um, that can be reprogrammed. In fact, that's what people have been talking for a long time. Software, you know, concepts like software-defined radios or cognitive radios um, where, you know, the end dream is to have a system that is extremely flexible and reprogrammable so that you can use it anywhere, you know, according to any standards. So that's the end of the talk. Uh, this is me. Uh, as a graduate student, I spend an appreciable amount of time working inside clean rooms making these, you know, small devices that can be tuned around. So any questions are welcome. Uh, in a uh, uh, receiving uh, um, at the receiving end, yeah. uh, when uh, the receiver doesn't know what is the frequency coming to, mm -hmm. do we need now a, a sweeping or let's say a scanning device to be able to? Uh, that? I mean, for example, let's take let's take a cell phone in case you want to move it around and so on in certain different frequencies that you may need it, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, that's actually a very active and important research area in this you know, software-defined radio, cognitive radio realm where um, about spectrum sensing, right? right? You need to know what's coming in, yeah. Uh, yeah. what is the signal that you're interested in, what frequency they are, you know, how much power it is, yeah. and, and all that. And, and you also need to know the interference, right? Because right, you, you know, you need to know who is blocking you so that you can move away. Yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> when you want to do this thing automatically, then uh, what would be the mechanism you think in the future for the uh, uh, for the MEMS, which would basically be able to scan and so 
Yeah, so I think there are competing, you know, thoughts about this. Some, you know, would say that scanning may be a solution. Some would say, you know, maybe, you know, digitizing the entire thing wideband would be another possible solution. I think there is still, you know, different thoughts in the research community. Uh, but with MEMS technology, you know, for sure we know they can provide capabilities in terms of switching between circuits, right, uh, for applications where you don't need to be scanning all the time where you just want to reconfigure things that's definitely an area of application uh, but potentially they could be applied to sort of a scanning receiver or a transmitter <coughs> so in the cavity then uh, you want to basically move this uh, diaphragm i mean uh, back and forth till you find it and then stick with it yeah yeah that would be the idea yes I noticed in your geometry you have a cylinder. Yep. How sharp are the corners of that? Because breakdown is partly dependent upon the radii of those. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. And have you studied that part of it? Uh, not, not really. Um, so this is just basically a proof of you know concept okay. uh, device. We so we did the simplest machining possible. So sure. we just milled a cylindrical post around it. But I definitely agree that sharp corner is going to be more prone to break down because of the higher electric field. Is there and anything you could do with a, with a different gas in the cavity? I think so. Uh, um, yes, people have been using different gas to prevent breakdown, but I guess you only do it when there is no other resort. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because then you need to worry about sealing, about a hermetic packaging where you don't want the gas to leak out mm -hmm. and that as a whole level of you know more difficulty to sure. to the entire thing. Yeah. Sure. Yep. I think there is another question. Yeah. This is going to be implemented into the cell phones? Probably not. Okay, so that's a very easy answer because uh, if you look at the devices that I showed, the, these tunable filters, they are kind of big, as you might have uh, guessed. Um, the resonator itself is maybe about twenty, um, you know, twelve millimeters by 12 millimeters in diameter. Uh, in diameter. Um, so it's not likely that they're going to be integrated into a, into a cell phone, right? But potentially they could find application in a small base station. Today, we, you, have, you look at the base station being mounted on top of a tower, but you know, we may be moving towards smaller and smaller base stations where you could have several maybe inside the room. Uh, and there you don't worry about volume or weight all that much, you know, as you would in, in a cell phone. So that's one area where this could be applied to. And in terms of power handling, that's actually right about uh, suitable. You know, these filters we handle about, you know, one watt, two watt or more. You know. uh, that's okay. Uh, since the pizza are here, um, uh, let me uh, thank uh, Dr. Liu who really gave us a very thoughtful, uh, instructive uh, type of lecture. I mean, I really enjoyed it. So let's give him a hand. Thank you.